in some ways it's an overdue uh, separation from a government that has got worse progressively um, and the decisions on the Tarkine, the green lighting of uh, the big mines up at uh, up, up in the northwest and the big uh, CSG uh, field in uh, Gloucester, you know, made it um, impossible, I think, to keep a close alliance going. Um, it is a pity in a way that the major part of the speech, which was an attack on the mining corporations and how they own the political process and how you know, Liberals are in bed with them and Labor's not much better, um, that, and that the Greens were now going to make it quite clear that they were, they were, they were with the people and with communities against new coal mines and against new CSG developments, that that got overshadowed by the, the parliamentary kind of manoeuvring. Uh, when that turn of the Greens to a much more activist and clear-cut position is, I think, very important and something to be welcomed. Was the, was the mining tax a, a major part of the disappointment or was it the, the more recent uh, No, you're decisions? right. The mining tax... The mining tax has been a running sore with the Greens. I mean, they did move amendments when the mining tax was introduced to toughen it up and to, and to widen it and to deepen the, the take. Um, the mining tax is, you know, is a dud, uh, and, and that is a big thing. I mean, it, it's, it's quite interesting in a way that, um, you know, the tax take uh, on profits for mining companies in Australia runs at an average of 27%. In Norway, it's 70%. Ecuador, it's 85%. Um, you know, which is next door to nationalising, really, I suppose, when you're taking 85%. So, you know, it is a dud, and it is something that's disappointed. And the, the Greens actually went to the Parliamentary Budgetary Office and asked how much the Kevin Rudd-Ken Henry tax, which is, you know, not socialism or anything, how much that would have raised over four years. And they said uh, $29 billion, as against the $4 billion this one is budgeted, which we might even rate that in. With that extra 25 to $29 billion, a lot could be done. The, the, the other major area of work that the Greens did with the Labor Party was, was the carbon tax ETS deal. Now there's a report that came out just yesterday that suggests that this might be, you know, a, a, as much of a dud in the sense that almost all the money raised by the carbon tax is going back in the form of compensation uh, to the biggest polluters, and they've they've basically passed the cost on to the to, to, to the ordinary households in terms of in forms of higher bills. Um, so is is there a rethinking? I think it can be said generally of the Greens that they wanted a higher than five percent uh, target as far as the reduction of emissions is concerned. They also are strongly opposed to the export of emissions, which is enormous via the trebling of our coal exports. And a lot of us in the Greens uh, want direct investment. It's only by, it seems to me, public enterprise, uh, especially in renewables, that we're actually going to make a mark on the switch to a decarbonised economy. I mean, I think the carbon tax and the Clean Energy Fund, um, they were, you know, it was a beginning. It was only a beginning, and the results may be disappointing, which seems to me just to reinforce the argument that we've got to go further and we've got to go stronger as far as decarbonising the economy is concerned. It's a big ask to decarbonise an economy, but and I think it can only be done by public enterprise, by intervention, by communities and by governments. It's not going to be done by the market. It's not going to be done by corporations. So, yeah, I mean, it's a start, I think, the, the carbon package. Uh, but it may be as disappointing as you say in the results, which are just strengthened, it seems to me, the argument that we've, you know, that we've got to push hard for public enterprise to really decarbonise the economy. In both the negotiations that the Gillard government did around the mining tax and the negotiations around the carbon tax ETS, the vested interests that, that, that Ross Garner warned about seem to have come away with, uh, with, with, with a fantastic deal. So. So, I mean, how, what's, what's the Greens' solution to this problem? Because it is clearly, you know, a systematic imbalance of power that we're talking about here. Absolutely. And that's the encouraging thing uh, about the, the speech in Canberra on, on Tuesday and earlier speeches she's given recently, is that the Greens seem to be now awake, the official leadership of the Greens seem to be now awake, that they can't achieve anything without... You know, a mass movement, a determined and 
public supported movement outside. That is absolutely crucial. That parliamentary representatives alone are powerless without that mobilised public opinion, without a real movement out there. Now there have been Greens like Leary Annan who's never stopped saying that. We need the extra parliamentary movement, we need the movement outside, the parliament isn't enough, parliamentary representatives aren't enough. And that's, that line has seems to me to be taken up now by the leadership uh, at the federal level. So, you know, those kind of movements seem to me to be encouraging. One of the few sustained broad uh, social movements that we've seen in recent times has been uh, uh, around opposition to coal seam gas and, and to some extent now to other forms of uh, non-conventional gas, shale gas mining, etc. And it, it's would you see this movement as having had a, a, an impact on politics? Oh, yeah. It's an incredibly potent movement. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the recent successes it's had in forcing the O'Farrell government to mm. back off uh, the, the one in the western suburbs, the one at St Peter's, um, has been, you know, have been real signal victories and I think the movement could celebrate them. They've still got big battles to fight. And if you go to northern New South Wales, for instance, it's extraordinary the amount of community opposition mm. there is. And community opposition is not just verbal or formal, it's a community opposition that will get out there and blockade roads and, you know, go on marches and go on demonstrations and will go to public meetings and howl down ministers of the Crown and so on. It's a very angry and very broadly based movement. And I think it's a, it's a prefigures the future. If you can get a movement like that going around you know, essentially environmental questions like CSG, I think that augurs well for the future. And I'm really pleased that Greens are involved in it. And they're involved in it with a whole lots of other people, you know, the Socialist Alliance and other political groups. And so it is that broad, in, in a broad movement that I think we've got to try and build around stopping any more coal uh, and other kind of environmental questions that, you know, that, will, that will intrude in the future. So what, what practically uh, do you envisage uh, as, a, as an overall outcome of the coming federal election? Because it certainly looks very likely that there's going to be a, a, an, an Abbott win. Um, do, you, do you see a wipeout in both houses? And, and how, how will the Greens come off? The figures don't look very good in the opinion polls. And it's going to be an almighty battle. Um, and it will take a lot of campaigning and a lot of um, arousing of, of the public, it seems to me, to avoid that very bad wipeout and both houses of parliament. Um, I mean, the be clearly the best result would be what we've got now, which is a minority Labor government dependent on a larger contingent of Green representatives, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives. That is, as you say, a, a long shot, but it's what we've got to aim for. And in, in doing it, we've got to start to build the movement so that if Abbott, the Abbott Liberals do get uh, government and do get a majority in the Senate. You know, we've got the beginnings of the resistance uh, that's going to be absolutely necessary if they're going to be stopped because it seems very little doubt to me that they will attempt to wind back the, the clock as far as the welfare state is concerned, as far as they reintroduce the, you know, the worst elements of work choices. They are extraordinarily friendly with the, with the mining corporations. Um, you know, the, uh, they've, you know, they, they, they believe in redistribution of income upwards. Um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a very hard period in Australian society if they get in. And the best we can do is try to stop them. And if we can't do that, to begin to build a movement to, you know, that will be the beginnings of the resistance. Why do you think we have got to this point? Yeah. In? On so many of the important questions, the Labor Party and the Labor government has folded. I mean, they have adopted policies that are Howard policies, or even worse, whether it's on refugees or um, you know, uh, taxation policies, you know, the, the inequalities have got worse, whether it's on lavish aid to uh, private schools, whether it's on slugging, you know, single parents, all the, and the Northern Territory intervention, you know, obviously. Um, these are Howard policies, and Labor's either adopted them or, you know, continued them. And I think that is terribly dispiriting and um, demobilising as far as the progressive side of politics is concerned. So it's not surprising that the Tories are coming surging back, it seems to me. It's because Labor has dropped the ball. What do you make of the potency of the refugee issue? It's, it's been credited with, you know, the dip in 
electoral support for the Greens. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that that's the reason for the dip in, uh, in the Green support. And I'm, I'm certain that in Grangler and in Sydney, where Diane Hiles is running, we will be running a quite principled campaign on refugees. And I think as the refugee um, issue plays out, uh, with more and more you know, appalling news from Nauru and Manus Island and so on, that people will begin uh, to shift, public opinion will begin to shift to a much more humanitarian and decent stance. So I'm not, I'm not uh, necessarily thinking it's going to be a, a minus or a negative for the Greens if they make it a big issue in the elections. There has been you know, a consistent breaking down of the value of human solidarity from both the major parties. And in a sense, if, 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 if this is what the public is getting told, you know, don't, don't value human solidarity, then I guess even in terms of economics, uh, this has a certain follow through. Um, pe people look to, to other solutions, or even if they're desperate ones, to try and you know, save their jobs or whatever. Yeah, that, I mean, we've seen in Western Europe, we've seen the rise of neo-fascism and so on. But I think it's something that the Greens and you know, uh, organisations like Social Alliance have in common, which is to encourage that sense of solidarity and a common future and cooperation, those kind of values. And you're right, most major parties are attacking them and both major parties um, champion individualism and neoliberalism in all its aspects. So I think, yes, this election and the following elections are going to be a real choice, you know, what kind of society we want. One where solidarity and cooperation are valued, or one where it's dog eat dog and, you know, uh, it's not a very, you know, nice place to live. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think you put your finger on probably the underlying civilizational or cultural kind of conflict that we're, that we're facing in this election and in the future. An issue that, that uh, was said to have stung the Greens in, in the Grandler area in the last state elections was, was the, the controversy around the uh, council's position on uh, boycott, divestment and sanctions um, yeah. against uh, I'm not Israeli convinced. occupation. Do, do, do you think this is, is a major factor in, in, in the electorate and, and what position? Are the Greens taking to this election on Palestine I'm solidarity? Not, I'm, not, um, I'm not convinced that it was uh, as potent as uh, the mainstream media wanted to argue. Um, I mean, the swing to uh, the Greens in Marrickville was about 3%. Mm. In Balmain, next door, where it wasn't an issue, it was about 1%. So uh, you might want to argue that the swing would have been to the, to the Greens would have been larger, but you know, uh, it was much larger the swing to the Greens than in the seat next door which the, which the Greens won. So it doesn't seem to be much empirical evidence that it, uh, that it was, you know, that it was a, a, as potent a negative factor as people said. Um, I'm a long time supporter of self-determination and justice for Palestinians and I'll continue to be. Um, the, the party's position is no longer to support BDS. Uh, but I'm a representative of my electorate, and if there's a push for, you know, for strong support via the BDS or some other action for to support Palestinians, then people will find a uh, uh, an eager listener uh, in their new MP in, in Grainler if that's the kind of thing that the you know, the, the voters in the constituency in Grainler uh, are appearing to want their representative to take up. So, Hall, you're someone who's um you know, quite a figure in the left in Sydney. Um, do you still see the Greens as a as a broad church that that regroups um, or has a place for for socialists uh, in in as, as as part of a new movement? Well, this is an argument, of course, yeah, I have with plenty of people on the left who are outside of the Greens. Um, I do. I mean, I think there is a real place for what I might call eco-socialists inside the uh, Greens, that there is a, exists inside the Greens a political biodiversity. There's no hiding the fact that there are uh, what somebody's called neoliberals on bikes inside the Greens. But there are people genuinely looking for a, you know, a great transformation of the existing society. Um, and know that it has to change fundamentally if we're going to get to a situation 
where you know we do more with less. And if we stop the world, if we are to stop the world cooking, or we stop it being, you know, pillaged of its of its resources. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't want to poo poo people that are left um, organising independently either. But I can see no reason why people who are um, you know, fundamentally socialists and believe in uh, the, you know saving the environment can't join the Greens as well. Is the left and the Greens under some pressure, though? Yes. Now, there have been a few changes. Well, there's certainly been a lot of public discussion about uh, factional conflicts, and, and the New South Wales Greens have been, you know, identified as a more left-wing part of the of the Australian Greens that has come under some pressures. And in addition to that, um, a recent policy conference, uh, a degree of uh, parliamentary flexibility independence and, and, and a generalisation of, of policy has taken place and you know it's, it's widely seen as moves to shift uh, the Greens further to the centre at least. Is this true? There, there, there has been some, um, as you say, uh, flexibility uh, and some more generalised wording introduced to the, the policy. I think it has been exaggerated and certainly I don't think it inhibits local representatives or the New South Wales Greens as a whole from taking up from time to time more advanced positions than other states uh, may want to take up. So, I mean, the great thing about New South Wales is, is that it's got a constitution that privileges and concentrates power in local groups. Um, and the party, is, the New South Wales party coordinates uh, uh, and acts via consensus and so on. So there's still plenty of scope both in the platform and in the way that Greens are set up for um, bold principle initiatives. So I think probably uh, this talk of parliamentary flexibility, the drift to the right and so on, may well have been exaggerated. What about the vision? I mean, is, are the Greens able to project a convincing vision for the future? If there's a battle of visions, there's, a, there's, there's, there's green capitalism on one hand, there's eco-socialism or some form of uh, cooperative uh, uh, en environmental society that's being imagined. I mean, it's, it's not a settled question. So how, you know, I mean, how, how, how do the Greens come across? You know, what, what, what are they projecting themselves as? Well, you're right, there is that diversity in the, in the green position. But um, the great challenge of the 21st century is to come up with a society that is, um, you know, if you like, embodies the Greens' four founding principles, which is grassroots democracy and a sustainable, uh, uh, ecologically sustainable economy in a non-violent, peaceful world with maximum social justice. Um, that is a real challenge, and that's a real argument going on. It's a pity it's an argument only going on within the Greens, uh, or between the Greens and people on the left like the Socialist Alliance. It seems to me that the kind of debate that wider circles and one would hope large parts of the Labor movement would get involved in in the future. But I, I don't think we can be very dogmatic about what form the society will take, um, but it will take a different form to society we've got now, there's no doubt about that.